Welcome to University Drive, your pathway to the transformational work of University of the Bahamas. Our goal is to build a better Bahamas by shaping tomorrow's leaders today, finding solutions to challenges and forging new opportunities for growth. University Drive, where faculty, staff, students and alumni travel the road of progress together with you. From destructive hurricanes, storm surges, and flooding to salt intrusion in water resources and other developmental threats, East Grand Bahama has endured its share of challenges over the years. Yet the willpower of its people to rebound has remained strong. Developing resilience is at the heart of a three-year project which has been launched to restore major natural habitats in East Grand Bahama to increase residents' earnings through ecotourism and to strengthen environmental monitoring and evaluation. Encompassing 49 acres of land and ecosystems, the Implementing Land, Water, and Ecosystems Management in the Bahamas, IW ECHO, the Bahamas Project, is part of a larger regional undertaking for the Caribbean entitled Integrating Water, Land, and Ecosystems Management in the Caribbean small island developing states. Today, University Drive will focus on just that, implementing land, water, and ecosystems management in the Bahamas. My guests today are Ms. Rochelle Newbold, Director of the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection, and Ms. Melissa Ingram, the IW ECHO National Project Coordinator. I would also like to mention that Ms. Newbold is also responsible for the implementation of this project as the director of the Department of Environmental Planning, one of the many portfolios that fall under her purview. Ladies, thank you so much for being my guests on University Drive. Thank you for having us. So there's no secret that East Grand Bahama has sustained its fair share of destruction most recently as a result of Hurricane Dorian. And I think in recent times with the transition from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, we see a greater shift on things directly related to climate change and the environment. And I think before now, um, it was something that we just glossed over because we really didn't see the connect. But now Hurricane Dorian has made climate change very real for us. What is the Implementing Land, Water and Ecosystems Management in the Bahamas project all about? And if I'm not mistaken, this is tied to a regional initiative as well as to the United Nations. So it's a, it's a three-prong approach. Can you tell our listeners what this project is really all about? Yeah, so this project, the Implementing Land, Water and Ecosystems Management in the Bahamas project is part of a regional aspect um, the larger IWECO community, which has about 12 countries participating, all with their own nationally developed um, projects to supplement each country that's participating. Here in the Bahamas, we are focusing on East Grand Bahama, as we said, and this project actually was initially developed in about 2014. Um, it was supposed to have ended in 2019. However, we have recently just got started in 2020. And the government, of course, post Dorian has gone up and listed all of the projects that are relative to the islands that were affected. So we're hoping that, of course, we can show the output of the projects as it relates to both the environmental concerns as well as the economic and human side of it. Um, all of the outputs will connect. Um, persons at this time might not see that, but hopefully through this project we can really bring awareness and education related to all of those aspects we do have four project components um, each component is of course directly related to different things so the first component speaks towards the monitoring and evaluation to be developed and under that we will have a biodiversity inventory of the east grand bahama area um, developed as well as a watershed management plan um, the second component speaks to having those monitoring components dealt with on an international certification level. Um, the third component deals with capacity building within the country. And the last component deals with knowledge exchange. Um, just making sure that what we're learning through the project is voiced to the public 
as the project is implemented, but also at the end. Ms. Newbold, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, only to say that with respect to those components, one of the key things that we really are moving this department in general, and with the use of the, the opportunities afforded to it by this, this project, is the data collection. A lot of times within the country, we, we don't have the data that is necessary to make to inform decisions about how we want to either live in harmony, harmony with or benefit from our environment or whether or not we want to make modifications to our environment. The passage of Hurricane Dorian has brought to the forefront the need for knowing what was before so that we can determine how it should be restored or what it is or any um, level of change that we should make to create a new after, right? Because when Dorian came through, there was a lot of damage to mangrove systems, right? There was a lot of damage to infrastructure. There was a lot of damage to the coastline. But what was this coastline before, and not just before Dorian, but before our intervention in terms of modifying it for our beaches or our hotels or whatever the case may have been, our private homes. Understanding what nature is and how it contributes to the environment that we tend to enjoy and understanding how that may be changed and how that change is going to impact us by virtue of a hurricane or just by erosional um, episodes over time. That's an important feature when you're talking about national development and sustainable development. It's important for the people of the Bahamas as well as the government of the Bahamas to have a good understanding of those things. Getting the data, understanding the data, monitoring the environment and ensuring that everybody has access to that information it's key for an informed decision all around. Thank you. And I think that is probably one of the areas in which the university is, is collaborating with this initiative. Um, and, and I must, I, I forgot to say that at the onset that the university um, is a partner of this project. Um, and that's why we have you here on the show because people are like, well, are they alum? Do they work at the institution? Um, but we, and, and as the National Tertiary Institution, it is our mandate and our responsibility to be engaged in projects and initiatives that have national implications. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned data, and I think um, Ms. Ingram, Melissa mentioned four project components. I think I missed one of them. She said monitoring and evaluation, international certifications, knowledge, Knowledge exchange. Knowledge exchange and then something about capacity. Right, capacity building. Capacity building. Um, and I think these are kind of standards against all project management. But when we think about this project in particular, um, why was it necessary for this project to focus on Grand Bahama and specifically East Grand Bahama and how will all of these project components um, connect as it relates to what you are embarking on? So this project is gonna be focusing on East Grand Bahama, namely because of the cruise restorations, which is one of the aspects of the project we will be targeting. Um, and why this is important is because these creek areas, these wetland areas are comprised of native um, habitat, mangrove forest, as well as pine forest, um, which in the instance of East Grand Bahama is a unique kind of um, habitat where you find the mangroves within the pine forest, within the wetland. Um, but when you have the lack of proper ecosystem functions, um, i.e. where you have um, causeways, blocking creeks, and then the hydrologic flow of the water system is no longer working as functional as it should be, then you have other issues that come about um, that can affect humans, but also the habitats and the areas around them. And that's part of what we're trying to target and tackle through this. Um, definitely the creeks that we're working towards are the August Creek system, which is inclusive of Snapper Island and the Queenstown Ridge Creek, as well as the North Shore Gap. Now, I have a question. Had Hurricane Dorian not come and bring with it the destruction that it did. 
would East Grand Bahama still have been the focus of this project and initiative? Or did that hurricane highlight the vastness and richness of that, that ecosystem and that community for this to be the target? No, the, the, identify, the identification of East End Grand Bahama uh, for this project had nothing to do with Dorian. As we said, the plans for this project was well in advance of 2014, so well before Dorian was even a thought in the minds of, our, of the Bahamian people. Uh, we already, the creek systems that Melissa spoke to, we were already sensitive to the point of knowing that these creek systems were being impacted and that actions needed to be taken in order to restore them because they would have a knock-on effect on the fisheries um, product for Grand Bahama in general. Most every school child knows that wetlands are important because they serve as nursery areas for the fisheries. And if these areas are, are impacted or destroyed or removed from the, the functioning ecosystems, then you're going to have a knock on effect with fisheries, which is going to affect the cultural um, and the atmosphere. We have the West End, you know, at West End of Grand Bahama, they have their little fish fry, um, fishermen sort of set up. And then at the East End where you don't have a lot of development per se, but there was activities, man-made activities that were having a very substantial impact on the environment on the Eastern side of Grand Bahama, where you did have, in fact, a lot of wetland systems, a lot of the coppice areas, a lot of the creek systems, which were all providing the benefits um, that we enjoy from the marine perspective. And if that matter hadn't been addressed, then we would have seen a crescendo of impacts that would have reverberated um, throughout the, the island of Grand Bahama in short order. So environmentalists, because our partners, it wasn't just the government, the government working along with the Bahamas National Trust, working along with um, the Ministry of Works and others, everybody understood, because right now the government actually has the Ministry of Works is working in the area of these creek systems to restore them, to remove the causeways, to look at different infrastructural designs that would help to uh, provide for the level of access that is desired by people, but designed better. So rather than being in conflict with the environmental needs of this, the area, it'll be actually working beneficial to the environmental needs of the area. So bringing, one thing that Dorian did bring to the project is a re, evaluation. What was designed in 2014, when we came back in 2019 and had our, our first meeting in Grand Bahama and we met with the stakeholders from Grand Bahama and we said, listen, these are the things that we looked at and we identified between 2014 and 2016. Are these things still relevant given that Dorian has now impacted Grand Bahama? And what we found was there was a resounding yes. These were still issues that needed to be redressed regardless of Dorian's presence and impact. You, you mentioned it briefly, but I'd like to, to ask who are, what was the impetus for this project and who are the project partners? You mentioned Bahamas National Trust, Ministry of Works. I mentioned UB, I don't know if there are others, but who are the, the partners involved in this initiative and how do they all connect? Well, all of them, well, Grand Bahama, sorry, the Bahamas National Trust has the Lukaya National Park. And as they, they were in close proximity to the East End Grand Bahama um, ecosystem, they, they were aware of what was going on. They were also talking with local fishermen and bonefish guides and just the regular average Bahamian who likes to go out there and enjoy Mother Nature. And so they were getting reports and they were seeing what was going on um, and determining that there was a problem um, Bonefish Topping and Trust, they were working together with their partners and they were um, in and of them, themselves were restoring or reopening certain creek systems because they were seeing the devastation that was happening. It was actually like a watershed moment where everybody was noticing what was going on and you had a multiplicity of individuals who are individuals or organizations. They were all coming together to highlight this concern about what was happening to the East End Grand Bahama ecosystem. Now, when you have your initial group of stakeholders, you know, that amorphous group of everybody, this outcry, 
And then you have to have your, your key person to then decipher that information down to actually designing and writing a project and then seeking the funding for that project and having that project submitted to, to the government. Those would have, you know, that, that comes down to a more finer and finer point in the funnel design because the beginning was a whole bunch of persons and we, can, we still consider them stakeholders and important because as a part of this project, we still have to go back to them to get their, feed, their feedback, to get their support, for them to be a part of the process. There will be training opportunities, there will be workshop opportunities. We, we're introducing an eco-touristic setup for, for the individuals who will be able to use and access that area such that it will have a knock-on economic benefit for those in that local community. And because it is these same persons in this community who are using this resource, who are close to this, this environment, they also become de facto managers and ensuring that, hey, that doesn't get damaged. That continues to contribute because I am now benefiting from it. We are looking to redesign access, like I said, to this area such that these people could do kayaking and birding tours, that there would be um, infrastructure such as boardwalks that are in harmony with the environment rather than trying to contour or control the environment to meet a need that's um, resistant to its natural um, intent, you know? And all of these things are coming to a head. I think if anybody in the country right now is more environmentally sensitive, it probably are those individuals who are living in, in Grand Bahama at this time, who can truly benefit and appreciate what could have been lost or what has been left or how we need to address and um, remediate the damage that has been done. And so having those larger stakeholders like the general communities in and around East End Grand Bahama, having the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the bone fishermen participate, having the Bahamas National Trust and their employees um, participate, having the forestry unit provide assistance and participate, having the Ministry of Works, their integrated coastal zone management unit um, participate. All of these things come to a, a, an apex of making sure that this project could be the best, most successful, and hopefully very efficient um, project as is possible. I do definitely want to appeal to the people of Grand Bahama because we have a lot of things. We talk about our partnership with, with um, the university, yes. And the university right now is undertaking a series of surveys with the re local residents. And we do need people to participate and to answer the questions so that we would get the data, so that we would be able to make informed decisions based on that data set regarding what is their concern, what are their desires, what do they want to see, you know, what has changed since we were last down there. We are also opening an office in Grand Bahama such that there will be a representative, even though the project is managed out of Nassau, there will be a local representative who will be able to interact and to connect with individuals in Grand Bahama about the project, keeping the project vital and, and um, relevant. We also have a website where we talk about the project and where we post things regarding the project. And then of course we do social media, Instagram and the Facebook about the project. So all of these things, so we try and those who are coming into the community, we are trying to bring to this area, opportunities, hope, a new vision, a destiny. Dorian has definitely shown us as well as COVID that there are niches that are still available for the Bahamian, for Bahamians at large to participate in, to act in, and maybe look at the way we, we considered our economy before, or maybe looked at our environment before, changing all that, you know, and it's good it's good when man can, can step back and rethink because sometimes we just bust right in, we bulldoze ourselves on a course of action only to turn around and look back and see the devastation and realize that wasn't the right and proper thing to do. You said quite a bit um, during that um, just now. And, and one thing, as you were mentioning all of the participants and the you know, people that are involved, and the partners, I think every single Bahamian ought to be a stakeholder because whether we live in East Grand Bahama, whether we live on the island of Grand Bahama or the island of New Providence, our waters, our ecosystem is all interconnected. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm no expert in environmental matters, but I'm thinking that what happens in one 
marine ecosystem in Grand Bahama can have an impact on a marine ecosystem in Bimini or Andres. Um, and I think at some point we all have to take a greater interest um, in our environment. I think we've glossed over it for so long. We've sold this um, notion of sun, sand and sea um, without really understanding um, how important our environment is to our sustainability and not just say in our country, but, but the world over. And I remember I interviewed on the same show, Christopher Russell, the director of forestry. Yes. And I was just, I was amazed. I left that show like, I, I'm still grappling with some of the facts that he shared on that show. And because I, I mean, as a child growing up in the Bahamas, I never learned half of those things in, you know, growing up. Now, all credit to me, I never did geography. I did history. I had the option of history or geography. I did history and not geography. But I'm sure some of my, you know, counterparts would have learned those things in geography. And I'm thinking, as a Bahamian, whether I do history or geography, these are things that every Bahamian ought to know because it dictates how we live our lives. Like we don't seem to see the connection between our everyday living and the environment. So as simple as, you know, releasing helium balloons and the impact that that can have, we never thought about it. And when the ban was placed, so you had to get permission when we looked at sustainability, people were up in arms. But if we know the why, then, then getting people to fall in line would be so much easier. So I can imagine that you have a very large educational campaign that you must embark upon. And shows like this provide the opportunity for us to get information out to the general public. And so it's important that we, we get the information out because, and to make it simple, and relatable to the average person so that they could see the connection between what it is you're hoping to achieve and the small role that they can play. Now, you mentioned the opportunities and the hope and the vision for East Grand Bahama. You mentioned bone fishing, you mentioned creek systems. I wanna go back, I wanna start defining these things so that people get an understanding because as the experts, as the technocrats, as the you know, you, this is your life. This is what you, you know, went to school for. This is the work that you do. And sometimes we take for granted that because we know something other people do. When we talk about creek systems, I've heard about mangroves. Are mangroves and creek systems the same thing? Or are they different? And how are they connected? Break that down for the, for the listener, please. So uh, my, mangroves are the trees that exist in the creek system, which is generally a flowing body, body of water. For us, we don't have any lakes and rivers. Uh, we only have creek systems, which is controlled by the ebb and flow of tides, right? So Andres being one of our most well-known creek systems, being the largest wetland system that we have in this country, they will show clear and distinctive, you know, there are areas where kids would go in certain communities and they'll just jump in at one end and come down the creek system and another settlement at the next end because of the flow of, of the sea through that, that area uh, where the mangroves have created a channel because wherever there are mangroves, mangroves are the precursor to the building of land. They trap sediment and they help to start the building of a landmass. The funny thing with that though is, um, while they're doing that, they also provide habitats, like I said, for the fisheries nursery. So they act as the nursery ground for fish, turtle, lobster, count every, it's like the preschool of all your fishery species. They come and they hang out there, be it by um, the, the varying levels of their larval stages before they go out back into the ocean where we tend to go around catching them or they come into the, the, the creek systems for there to engage in their reproductive activities because it's a safe area for their eggs to, to hatch and develop. So mangroves are the vegetative um, representatives in a wetland system. The creek systems would be like the channels that occur in that area um, that give, that bring in the fresh uh, waters into the area and that take out the say foul water or deoxygenated water because anything that's stagnant, you know, it has a difficulty, particularly in our hot summer months where we have a lot of heat, 
it's hard. Anything hot has a hard time um, retaining oxygen. So those creek systems being open with that ebb and flow of the tide bring fresh and refreshing oxygen back into the creek system. They take out snails, carbon dioxide. Fishes need to breathe just like us. They help keep the system clean. When we block off the system, there is no longer that exchange with the oxygen. Do you see the oxygen um, composition of the water quality starts to go down? You'll see the creek system starts to um, silt up a lot faster than it would normally have, thus not um, contributing to the ecological function of, of a nursery habitat. Um, and then, then you start to see the decline in the number of fish catches because now these little babies can get back out to be teenagers and grown fishes or the, the adults can not get into the creek systems to reproduce. So they might spawn out in the open ocean and then all of that is lost because you know, it doesn't have any little nooks and crannies to hide up, hide up under. And then, you know, mangrove systems also um, play a big role in our crabs. So the, our, um, the ghost crabs that we love to eat in the coming months of June for Father's Day. It's important for us to understand that so many people depend on it the way we depend on water and fresh air. Animals and, and creatures of, of the environment depend on these varying habitats that exist. A part of this project is going to deal with the issue of the coppice that's right next to the wetland and the creek system. Our native pine, when we talk about Director Russell, you know, one of the big things that Bahamans fail to grasp, I might want to say, is the pine trees, not the casuarina trees, but the pine trees that we see along, say, for New Providence, um, Gladstone Road, Coral Harbor Road, Carmichael Road. Those trees exist nowhere else in the world. And when we seek to start clearing and cutting them down without a thought, we are on the verge of an extinction process. And I'd like to draw the example what happened in Haiti with dead deforestation. Haiti didn't go from zero to 60 in a day. That was a period of time and there were repetitive actions that was being taken that drove them to that point. And if we are not careful, we are going to find out that we will be faced with the same thing, the same issue. So areas around East End that are being proposed as national parks, extension areas, Alukaya National Park that already exists, it's all, it's very important for us as Bohemian not to lose the heritage that we have with respect to our physical environment, that is important. But an environment that is not benefiting the people is of no value. So this project wants to bring those two things together because they're not in opposing forces. God had always put the man in the garden, not because the man needed to change the garden, but by the man working in the garden, the garden would benefit and the man would benefit. They were complementary. The same is for us in our physical environment today. We could use the East End Grand Bahama. We could do what is necessary to gain access to and to ensure that our impact and our inclusion into it is not a constant um, deterioration of the product or the benefit that it derives. And we could also benefit by using and accessing those resources. One of the things or like the opportunities that we're presenting is the issue of ecotourism, bringing an ecotourism product to Grand Bahama, training people. I'm going to ask you to pause there because I, okay. I want to talk about ecotourism and we must take our first break. Sorry for having to cut you off, but we have to take our first break and we'll pick up from there when we come back. That concludes our first segment here on University Drive. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. To protect yourself and others from COVID-19, stay home as much as possible and avoid close contact with others. Wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth when you leave home. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Practice social distancing. If you must leave home, stay at least six feet away from other people and disinfect items you must touch. Limit in-person contact as much as possible. To prevent the spread of COVID-19 if you're sick, avoid public transportation, ride sharing, or taxis. Stay home if you're sick, except to get medical care. 
remember to call ahead first. Separate yourself from other people and pets in your home. Everyone is at risk of getting COVID-19. Older adults and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions may be at higher risk for more severe illness. This message is brought to you by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and University of the Bahamas. Welcome back to University Drive. I'm your host, Nikki Bo, and if you're just joining the show, my guests today are Ms. Rochelle Newbold, Director of the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection, and Ms. Melissa Ingram, the National Project Coordinator for IW Echo. We're talking about East Grand Bahama. We're talking about our environment. We're talking about our creeks, our mangroves. And you said something before the break that just startled me. I mean, like you said a whole lot of things that startled me, but one of the things that stood out was the interconnectedness of these creeks and mangroves. And I learned something new today about the ebb and flow of the tide and the creek system. My mom was born and raised in Kent Island and she always talked about a creek and I never knew what a creek was, but you just broke that down for me. And nobody could really explain the way that you did what a creek is. They just know a creek. And like you said, you could start swimming in one place and end up in the next settlement. Um, but, but the way that you indicated that the mangrove is a precursor to building to the building of land and the habitats that it creates. You also mentioned something about deoxygenated water and oxygenated water and how that creek, the tide and the flow helps to create that balance. And then you spoke about our pine, the copus, the native pine that you can find in Gladstone Road, Carmichael, Coral Harbor, Abaco. I mean, the first time I, I thought, I was like, when I went to Abaco for the first time as a child, I was like, can we have enough trees? Like I had never seen a forest in my life and there it was. But these are things that we often take for granted. And here it is now, there's a concerted effort to bring awareness, um, to restore, to collect data, to engage people so that we can benefit. And you said, the, if the environment is not benefiting people, it is of no value and that we're complementary. And you went back to the Garden of Eden and then you mentioned the word ecotourism. How do all these things connect and how, what is ecotourism? What, and what will the future of ecotourism look like as we take into consideration climate change and our need to be more sustainable? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ecotourism is akin to this. Okay, so we, we all go in through the issue of COVID right now, right? And when it first started and we were told that the, the the wholesalers weren't going to get their shipments in and the stuff in the stores were skyrocketing because now market forces were taking hold, right? Scarcity increased price and everyone was rushing out to get what they needed to get. And at that point, we were concerned as to whether we would truly be able to feed the nation, right? Because if these, these ships stopped coming, if the food stopped coming, we were going to be in some big, big trouble. When you talk about ecotourism, Ecotourism is seen in a general sense by the use of your environment in, an, in a way that contributes to your economic improvement, right? You can go into your environment. Sometimes it requires the harvesting of certain things, and then you turn around and you sell those products, or you introduce others to that environment and you teach them and you show them what presently exists, and then they pay you for doing that undertaking. When we are not necessarily extracting anything, removing anything from our environment, but it's a constant visitation of that environment that benefits us for some financial payment, that is the best use you could ever get out of your environment because the environment then is allowed to continue at its normal functioning processes. And all you doing is taking a photo or you know, just devouring the beauty and the ambience with your eyes. 
that has limited, little to no impact on that. But the individual who introduces you to that can introduce ones, tens, hundreds of people to that, and that product remains unchanged. When you consider the other alternative, which is the harvesting or the removal of, of those things, that requires a much, much more management, much more knowledge and understanding because you have to have an appreciation for how quickly that, that product that you're removing is regenerating itself, you know, and whether or not that's sustainable over time. So when we talk about ecotourism in terms of this project, we're talking about training individuals in the community who may at this present time not be working who may at this present time not be earning sufficient to meet their, their, their financial needs, training them, giving them other skills, giving them skills in um, bird, um, being a good bird tour guys, giving them skills in kayaking tours, giving them skills in walking tours, botany tours. You know, we have in our coppice areas, we have such a plethora of, of um, unique plant species these little Bahamian orchids, the little lizards that run up in there, the fact that we have that, what we called um, the, that, uh, the rock that's all oh, limestone. <laughs> uh, limestone. Limestone. Yeah, a limestone bed, but there's a name for it when it has all those dips and holes that escapes me right now. But that particular habitat creates an environment where the vegetation cover is different than if you have just a flat, you know, a flat area where our plants could come in or a cleared area where uh, we go in and we landscape. Nature has ways of creating vistas that are unique. And what we need to do is learn how to use what we have to generate what we need in order to sustain ourselves financially. It is a struggle in order to get that across because we also have um, the conflicting force with population numbers and living on an island. One thing you can be assured living on an island that the one thing that isn't increasing is landmass, right? Population numbers continue to go up. People continue, continuously need a job, a home. They want to start their families. That puts a heavy load on the environment. How do you sustain those sorts of things? And it does mean that we as a people, we are 47 years old as a country. What is our plan for the next three years when we turn 50? What are we really progressing towards? And we see a lot of that where we hit these targets like 30% by 2020. Um, we have all these international universal targets about the environment and how we want to seek to protect and to conserve the environment. And we, we set these targets, right? But to the person on the ground, what does that really translate to? If the East End Grand Bahamians understand and are able to utilize the value of the environment that's near them, they will be the best guardians of that environment. They will learn to live in harmony with that environment. They will understand um, the processes that aid that environment in, in um, producing the benefits that they now enjoy and they will hope to continue to enjoy. It, it really goes back to when we think about those old movies that you would have watched about how the Indians, you know, when they kill an animal and they would thank, um, thank the animal for giving of its life for their home, their own substance, right? Our ability to live in harmony with our environment is very, very important. It, it has psychological benefits to us, even if we don't talking about money. People are under stress, they need to get away. They just wanna sit there by the beach or in, in, the, in the woods, they just want to watch the animals, listen to the birds, lay back and look at the clouds. We're hoping to bring all that sort of stuff to the East End Grand Bahama with some the, the light infrastructure that we'll be putting there such that people would be able to access and enjoy. And I know I've been talking a lot, so I'm going to allow the project manager, who's really the one who's going to be spearheading a whole lot of this, to give some more insight on that. So as it relates to the ecotourism aspect, as Director Nubo had, um, I guess, suggested, we will be implementing a, a light infrastructural component, um, which, as already mentioned prior to the break, I believe, um, would include like a, a boardwalk, uh, a nature trail, bird watching activities, um, a lot of opportunities in that sort of venture. So you said that you know it's important for us to live in harmony 
And I think over the years, we've seen buildings go up and, and as the director of environmental planning and protection, you're responsible for quite a bit. And I'm sure there have been people advocating for developments to be discontinued or to not be approved um, because of the environmental impact it could have. And of course, you know, there has to be an environmental impact study. Sometimes that takes place on the back end rather than the front end. But are we now, are we catching up um, or are we leading the trail as it relates to this coexistence of humans and the environment and what we've done over the years as, as we've urbanized and developed the land. And you said that the one thing that is not increasing is the land mass, even though populations may increase. Yeah, well, let me, let me share a story. In 2000, the Bahamas hosted the first convention of the parties on biodiversity and the COP, they call it the COP, Conference of the Parties. And they were talking about biodiversity in all the world and how it was important. We were, they were seeing a global trend in the loss of biodiversity because of a plethora of issues, but they were all centered around human modification of the landscape. And individuals, scientists, United Nations individuals came to the Bahamas for that COP and two things happened. When on arrival, they said, where is your Ministry of Environment? We had none. We had none. There was no office who was within government that was charged with focusing on how do we manage, protect, and um, ensure the sustainable uh, development, I guess, of our environment as we as a country emerge through time, right? And then second to that, they visited a site. They were taken to a site by one of uh, very well-known um, environmental activists to a piece of property where they were just blown away. And this site was near a wetland habitat. These were international biologists. These were scientists and experts. They had never seen anything like that in any country they ever visited before. And they were like, wow, what is this? This ecosystem here, we, you know, they were just blown away by it. And so, you know, they wanted to know if we were putting this area under protection because it had to have been unique because it was, this was something they had never seen. And those two issues, those two stories, one as a country where we focus on tourism, where we, where we sell our environment to gather people to come here, we did not have a me mechanism in place that would help us to ensure that the product that we were trying to sell would always be healthy and available for us to constantly use over and over again. And two, in this particular instance, there was a habitat feature which existed that was not known by any of these individuals who had traveled the world over and they thought it was a unique thing and they, would have been, they were encouraging us to take a look at this because there may be something special here. We allowed that area to be developed as a subdivision, totally wiped out that ecosystem. It has been no trace has left to this day. In 2019, 19 years later, we then put in place legislation that created the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection. And under that legislative authority, we made it mandatory that the environment comes first, that the first consideration when we talk about development goes to the environment. Does this make sense? Will we be creating um, a problem that's going to be habitually creating issues for us over and over and over and over again because we have sought to change the environment so much that it's unable to perform the, its original duties. So now that we have that, that in, um, environmental legislation in place and now that it is mandatory for projects to complete environmental impact assessments or a level of environmental documentation that's you know, congruent with whatever they are proposing to do, that that has to occur. Now that it is mandatory that public consultation events occur, the onus is now on us, we, the people, to ensure compliance with the things that the law already puts in place. 
if it does not happen, it isn't because the law doesn't exist. It's because we as a people allow the injustice to occur. So we already have the vestitudes of helping us move along from zero to 60 in the course of the last two years, there's been a passage of several bits of environmental legislation. We constantly need to sit back, like I said, and look back and make sure that the decisions that we made made sense or were we just creating a wake of damage as it relates to our environment? Because as you say, with climate change, climate change and Dorian, mother nature has proven to us, there is nothing we can build that can stop what mother nature seeks to do. She will have her way and we will acquiesce. It is important for us that we try to live in harmony with our environment because mangroves, coral reefs, they play a part in storm surge. They try to protect the land against the inflow of that, um, that storm surge that floods and that holds water back. But the funniest thing is the first thing that we as people want to do when we talk about development, we want to cut through the, the coral reef to put in a marina or we want to dig out the wetlands to do a marina or we want to rip out the mangrove because they're creating too much mosquitoes around my house, right? But you will not have a house when the next storm surge comes along and pushes it down, right? When you could have keep your mangrove ecosystem in place and that would have allowed the mangrove system acts as a sponge, it would hold the water. So the sea may come into the land during the course of the storm, but when the sea, when the storm passes, that same wetland feature will allow the water to return to the ocean. When we change the topography of the land, we create areas where the water comes in up over whatever seawall or high elevation we put in and drops down into a valley. And then it sits there and it creates a lake and a pond. And now we truly have issues to deal with as it relates to flooding and mosquitoes and all those sorts of, of pestilence that comes in um, as a result of that. Climate change is something we, on an island, we really can't build enough infrastructure to protect ourselves from. We have to work with the environment to somehow tamper the level of the impact, the amount of damage that is gonna occur. I know in my own personal community, we had two wetlands on either side, our east and our west side. And one day you came home and somebody had bulldozed the, the wetland that was on the eastern side, totally pushed all the vegetation and, and dumped spill in it. Within a matter of months, we just had a, a, a rainstorm event that happened. And the homes that were around that area all experienced flooding where that, that never had to occur before. This was just regular rain. This was a no you know, hurricane or anything like that. We just had a, a, a dark cloud rain event. And there they were sitting in water where that wasn't there before, right? And it was only then that then people started to be concerned about the fact that, hey, what changed? The only thing that changed was that wetland that was there to the east is no longer there. So now this body of water sits here way after the event of the rainstorm. And, and those are the connections that we sometimes don't make in our own minds, what's going in and around our neighborhood. We see things happening and we'd be like, hmm, yeah, well, that ain't involved me. This is my little house or my little piece of property. No, everything in your environment affects you and your neighbors. And we all need to work together in harmony with our environment to protect it. And I know I said a lot there too, but I, I really want, I really want, you talked about the, the, the level of public education and awareness that we require um, and that's required of us in this department. You are right. It is tremendous. And that's why we need our partners to help us, like Bonefish Toppening Trust, like the Bahamas National Trust, like Friends of the Environment, like Breathe, like TNC. This is not something that only one set of individuals can do. It's a concerted effort. And we need the public. We need the general stakeholders. We need the lawyers, the doctors. All of us have to work together because all of us living on this one piece of rock. And as I said, this rock ain't getting no bigger. It only getting smaller. And we need to make the necessary adjustments such that we continue to benefit from the environment and the environment continues to be able to deliver because we allow it to function in the way God intended it to be. 
You're right. Like you said, you said a mouthful, but all very important, relevant, and valuable information for our listeners to ponder. One of the things you mentioned was the fact that marine biologists, and these are specialists, renowned specialists from around the world, would come to our country and be in awe of the diversity and the the richness of some of our ecosystems and even the uniqueness of it. Because like you said, the copus pine is found no place else in the world. And these are things that we take for granted. And then you mentioned the United Nations. And, and even with this project, the implementing land, water and ecosystems management, it's part of a, a regional project. In the larger context, to what extent has the Bahamas been meeting its international convention commitments regarding sustainable development goals related to our natural environment? Well, there are several goals that the Bahamas has, has committed itself to, and generally most of them center around the Convention on Biological Diversity, right? And we, we have been striving and we have been making um, strides being within the region um, oftentimes the first country to meet certain goals or the first countries to commit themselves to undertaking certain aspects. Melissa, I'm going to ask you to wrap things up. And this final question is going to be a three-part question. Um, but as we conclude this show, because time goes really fast, um, I want you to explain to our listening audience how you are engaging the community in this project. Um, how can the community get involved long-term in what is occurring? And how do you envision East Grand Bahama will, would have changed by the end of this project period? All right, so it's a loaded <laughs> three-part question, but basically as it relates to engagement of the community, um, we will be having various training opportunities and workshops coming out of the Ida Eco project as it relates to ecotourism, as it relates to contributing ideas and opinions towards the development of the watershed management plan, as well as the ecotourism developed sector as well. Um, as it relates to the biodiversity inventory, we will have some opportunities for residents to join in and take part of the data collection with our team that's going out. Um, so that will entail you know, species identification, going out into the field and learning what their environment is like. And long-term and short-term, those would be the goals that we have for community engagement. Um, like I said, as it relates to providing opinions to the watershed plan and ecotourism sector, we have surveys currently out that persons can contribute to, which would support us in how we develop based on what the residents feel towards the project and the project goals. Um, and basically the output that we foresee coming out of IW Eco is to have enhanced ecosystem functions um, where the mangrove ecosystem in the creeks, the wetland areas that we're targeting, have a better outcome um, due to the project intervention. Um, and that's going to be with the creeks that are going to be restored, their hydrologic flow, uh, water flow will be restored to its natural setting. Uh, we'll have reintroduction of fish species, and it'll just be, you know, a one of a kind experience for the East Grand, East Grand Bahama ecosystem, um, but also the humans that reside there. So the correlation between the two. Well, thank you so much for that, um, Melissa. And, you know, I just want you to, my husband is from Grand Bahama. So when, when the survey came out from the University of the Bahamas and we were sharing it, I sent it to everybody in all of the family chats and everybody that I know in Grand Bahama. So hopefully you guys would have gotten some responses from that survey. And we want to continue to encourage people to be actively involved in this process. It impacts all of us, no matter where in the Bahamas we live. What happens in one island ultimately affects us all because people migrate, people have families throughout the archipelago. And sustainability, I think, is the way of the future. And like we all said, if we learned nothing else from Dorian, it is the need for us to pay close attention to climate change and to have a better understanding of how our ecosystems work together and the role that we as individuals can play. Well, I thank you so much. Both of you, um, Ms. Newbold and Ms. Melissa Ingram have been the guests here on 
this episode of University Drive. And there's also always so much we can learn from our, our guests. And I'm just so thankful that we were able to explore this. That brings us to the end of today's show that concludes this episode. Like I said, my guests have been Ms. Rochelle Nubo, the Director of the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection, and the IW Echo Bahamas National Focal Point, as well as Ms. Melissa Ingram, the IW Echo National Project Coordinator. Thank you so much for making this happen. And thank you to my listening audience for tuning in to another episode of University Drive. Be sure to visit our website at www.ub.edu.bs for all the episodes of University Drive and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And be sure to join us next week, same time, same radio station for another episode of University Drive. I'm your host, Nikki Bo. Enjoy the remainder of your day. University Drive is a production of the Office of University Relations and the Communications and Creative Arts Academic Unit at University of the Bahamas. All rights reserved.